Hi everyone, uh, so thanks for joining us at our final webinar of FEDM's first data and model management webinar series. I'm Natalie Stanford and I'm the FEDM community lead and I'll be your host for this uh, final webinar of the series. As you may know, if you've attended before, FEDM is an initiative to support researchers, students, trainers, funders and publishers. In fact, anyone interested in data and model management in better data management practices. And we offer software advice, expertise and training, which make managing data and models in life sciences easier. You can find more about FEDM at our website at www.fair-dom.org, or you can follow us on Twitter at FEDM underscore EU. If you have any questions regarding FAIRDOM, you can get in touch with me at community at fair-dom.org. So once again, we'll start with a bit of news from FAIRDOM. Um, and this is that we're, we're hosting our first user meeting as a satellite meeting of the ICSB in Barcelona, which is happening on the 15th of September this year. And it's for anyone interested in using FAIRDOM software or services or people that are experts at data management that want to connect with us. There's a flyer attached um, if you look at the handouts below where you can find out more information and find out how to sign up. It's free to attend um, and you can register online for free now and also submit an abstract. Uh, today, uh, we're here with our guest, Martin Sharm, and he's from the Department of Systems Biology and Bioinformatics at the University of Rostock um, in Germany. So, Hi, Martin. Are you there? Hello. Hi, Natalie. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. You? Oh, quite good. Almost ready for the summer break. I think a lot of people are already there. Yeah, it's hot yeah. in Rostock. It's hot in Rostock. It's not quite so hot here, but it rarely is. <laughs> it's a nice day, though. So, um, Martin's a PhD student and he specializes in the development of tools and algorithms that assist systems biologists in model development and understanding. Bivis is the most well known of these algorithms and it's integrated in a model management tool within the FAIRDOM platform, SEEK. Today you'll be talking to us about the challenges in model management. If you have any questions uh, for Martin during the presentation, you can raise your hand in the interface, you can post a question in the questions panel. Um, on your control panel, um, or you can send a chat message directly to me or to everyone on the webinar. And I'll hand over for questions at the end of Martin's talk. Uh, and it's just a reminder, we'll be recording the webinar and make it available on the website in due course. So I guess it's over to you, Martin. Okay. So let me share my screen. Can you see my presentation? I can, yes. Okay, excellent. So, thanks Natalie for the opportunity to speak in the FEDM webinar series. Um, yeah, as Natalie already said, I'm a PhD student from Rostock and today I'm happy to talk about challenges and solutions for model management in the domain of systems biology. With this talk, I want to raise the awareness for different management challenges that we see in the domain of systems biology, and I'd like to show some approaches for different uh, solutions, and I'm trying to identify flaws and open challenges that are still to be dealt with. Um, yeah, I hope that I can help some of you orienting in the domain. You probably all know that the uh, number of computational models is continually growing. Looking at the Biomods database, for example, back in 2015, they started with uh, just 30 models. In the meantime, they managed to get 600 uh, plus models curated and almost 1,000 non-curated models that are in the queue. But not just the number of models is increasing, the models itself tend to increase in size and complexity. The average number of uh, reactions per model in the curated branch of biomodels is about a tenth of the average number of reactions in the non-curated branch. And moreover, models of course evolve over time. We continuously gain new insights, have new methods and extend our and, and correct our work. Um, and every body of you 
probably experiences that itself. You have a hard drive, your hard drive fills up with files and every other day you create a new directory for a new version of your model. Um, yeah, and this increasing amount of models and versions and documents, uh, of course, entails some, uh, some challenges. To discover and understand these challenges, let's have a look at the typical modeling workflow. In the beginning, we have the model creator. Maybe he has, he has some uh, experimental data for, or some theory and he wants to create an in silico model of the biological system. So he takes some modeling tool out there and creates a model. To save and exchange the model, he needs to serialize um, and, and encode it, preferably in some standard formats. Based on that, the researcher can define some experiments to analyze the system. And at some point, he wants to share his findings, for example, with collaborators or the whole community. So he needs to submit his simulation study, for example, to a database. Databases often have some private and some public uh, spaces and there may be a curator to run some quality checks and to improve and fix the submissions. On the other side, we have the model user. He maybe has some theory in mind and needs some models to evaluate, evaluate the hypothesis. So he goes to the database and searches for models that may fit into his research plan. He needs to compare and evaluate the uh, search results and the different studies. And as he decided for a study, he can finally run it in a tool of his choice, given that the model creator made sure that everything is encoded in um, standard formats. Um, yeah, this workflow is, however, not uh, necessarily such a line. Um, it is rather a stairway or a loop or something like that. So the model creator will typically also be a model user. So, and he may reuse other people's work. Just as the model user may, for example, um, create, modify, and extend the model that he retrieved from a database. And indeed, um, the model creator and the model user may be the same person, and the database in the middle might be his uh, local hard drive, and he needs, but he need, still needs to um, select a model from his repertoire. Nevertheless, every step in this workflow needs, needs some uh, tool support and entails a number of challenges. In the following, we will follow this workflow to have a look at the different challenges and the approaches to solve them. For this ta talk, I will, um, however, neglect the create model step and the run step, as those mainly involve the simulation tools. And there are many tools out there, so you, for example, know Copasi or Tellurium or Cell Designer and, and JWS, um, just to name a few. So let's start with the um, standard formats. You all know how important standard formats are, right? Using standards, it's easy to exchange your findings with other people on the domain and everyone can use their preferred tool to read and write the files. But I do not, do not, want, do not want to talk too much about standards. Um, in a recent um, talk in the series, Brad already talked about SBML and Neil discusses discuss the uh, SBOL language, um, and there are other standards to also encode, for example, simulation descriptions or visualizations. Um, there are many standards out there. Um, and using these standards, it's, for example, possible to better understand the published result. In 2007, for example, Calzon et al. Uh, published a study on the dynamical modeling of synthetical mitotic cycles in Drosophila embryos. Along with that study, there's an SBML model available from Biomolds database. Using a ZML script, 
I can easily rerun the simulation in a tool of my choice and reproduce the figure as published in the paper. But I can also update the parameters and evaluate the system under different conditions. And I can also change the output to study a different focus of the system. All that is uh, yeah, only necessary if, if we have uh, standards formats and that of course increases my trust uh, in the published systems and help me reuse their work. But there are of course uh, still some challenges with uh, standards. Um, we are, for example, still lacking cool clickable simulation studies where I can click a button next to a figure in a paper and immediately get the corresponding uh, simulation environment to rerun and reuse the experiment. The established standards also do not work for all cases. They already cover most things, but you cannot encode every feature and every method out there. Um, during the recent wholesale uh, symposium, when 40 students tried to encode a wholesale study in standard formats, they, cons they for example, discovered some issues with today's standards. For example, they, they are requesting better links from SBML models to genomics data, and they um, require some zooming for big SVGN diagrams to make them useful for everybody. Yeah, details about that can be uh, found in the IEEE report that I linked down there. Okay, as we just saw, a simulation study isn't just a single executable file, but it consists of a number of uh, heterogeneous data. There might be a model encoding for the biology, which may, for example, be saved as SBML or CellML, or even as an SBOL. Um, there are some semantic annotations that provide detail, detailed means to the model and its entities. The simulation description set up, set up the system and defines the execution strategies. We've seen ZML doing a good job here. There may be some experimental data, maybe some spreadsheets, and usually you also have some documentation, for example, as a PDF file, a published article, or some, some website. And last but not least, there may also be some uh, results, like plots and huge tables with numbers. So that's really all kinds of data. And if you want to share your results, you better make sure that you share all of them. Otherwise, your partners and reviewers won't be able to reproduce your findings. But how can you ship all the data? There are some cool approaches that may come handy here. One is called Research Object, and the other one is called Combine Archive. Both are containers to encode for complex projects. The research object, for example, is very general, as you can ship whatever you find interesting. It can be a simulation study, but it can also be a workflow, health records, even LaTeX projects with its many uh, source files. Um, yeah, and the research objects provide excellent support for linked data and provenance. Um, a combined archive, on the other hand, uh, was developed out of the systems biology community and is entailed for the needs of this domain. Um, therefore, there's already quite good tool support for simulation studies. And in the following, I will just have a look at combined archives. So what's the idea of that? As I said, you can think of them as some kind of container. You can put everything inside, and then you just need to make sure that this container finds its way to the recipient. On the technical side, there will be a manifest and some metadata stored along with all these files so that a tool that is aware of combined archives can immediately run the encoded simulation. If you want to learn it the fun way, you can go to Fixture and watch a model as tail. The model as tail is a video, a movie, that explains the idea of combined archives in a, yeah, in a little movie, where, where some researcher wants to transfer or share his uh, research results with a collaborator, um, but 
he has some trouble because the uh, simulator is not able to reproduce the original results. But just go to Fixture and um, see how it ends and learn a bit more about Combine Archives. There's also a fully featured Combine Archive available that can be used to yeah, give the whole thing a try. And yeah, so feel free to study and use it. It's available um, as Combine Archive from Fixture and also as single files um, we develop it on GitHub. Um, yeah, extensions and refinements as well as discussions are of course very welcome. Yeah, still there are so of course some, some challenges. Um, both approaches are quite young and they are lacking tool support. There are already a few applications supporting containers, but the big players still do not support research objects and combine archives. Moreover, combine archives just have limited support for provenance and linked data. The specification is very strict when it comes to metadata and everything more valuable won't be recognized by by all the software because it's not standardized. And I guess that's something that the combined archives can really learn from research objects. Okay, now you have your data ready to be shipped, but where should you send it to? Preferably to an open model repository so that everyone can profit from it. So let me quickly show you three good options in the systems biology domain. The first one is the biomodels database. Every model in the biomodels database has a web page. So um, yeah, so as you can see on my slide, you can usually download the model in different flavors of F SBML, so different levels and different versions, which are automatically converted into each other. And there's a publication attached to it, and yeah, that describes the system and the model. It's but the model itself is uh, stored in a hidden subversion repository, so you don't have access to it. But the guys at the Biomods database release a dump of their files every few few months, and I think that's like. Uh, twice a year or something like that, so you can get older versions of a model. Unfortunately, you cannot link to older versions in biomodels, you can just link to the latest version, so the versioning in, in biomodels database is still a problem. The next repository that I want to talk about is the Fusium model repository, or PMR2. They host thousands of models and hundreds of public projects. Every modeling project in PMR2 is basically a JIT repository. And everyone with access to the project can clone and study the history of all the files that are in this project. That's actually super cool. It's a bit like GitHub for modelers. You can also unambiguously um, link to a certain version of a model um, because their back web interface is quite sophisticated. And uh, yeah, so cu curated models are advertised in so-called exposures. Um, in my screenshot, you can see an exposure. Um, yeah, there's usually some nice visualization and all these things, and you also link to a, they also link to a um, publication and uh, describe the system. In the third repository that I want to mention, um, that's of course the Fathom Hub. The Fathom Hub is a bit different to the bo both other approaches. The other two that I just mentioned uh, specialize on a certain type of models and a special format, but Fathom Hub goes a different way. It manages all kinds of data related to a project and is therefore able to manage whole consortia. I stole this figure from Natalie. Some of you may know her. She's our host today. But the figure is quite good as uh, it shows you how projects and groups can be organized with all their files and data. Um, the Fabulum Hub is based on the Seek platform, so everybody can basically install their own private Fabulum Hub instance for our own private projects to manage them and all these things. 
The underlying Seek uh, tool uses an ISA structure to organize the data of the platform, so it distinguishes between investigations and studies and essays, and every essay may contain a PDF document or some model code or experimental data, for example, and it's all linked uh, to a corresponding study and to an investigation. But I guess every one of you is already familiar with the ISA structure, especially as Philippe uh, already presented in this FADM webinar series. If you haven't heard about the ISA structure, I want you to immediately send an email to Natalie and she will probably send Olga overnight to help you managing your, soft, uh, your projects. So we see uh, repositories already do sophisticated things, but there are still some open challenges. We, for example, observe that some repositories uh, lack proper version control and do not allow for linking to uh, certain versions of a document. It would also be cool to get better support for tracking and extracting provenance information. Yeah, and um, I'd like to know how contributed, uh, how who contributed to um, a certain model and in which way and um, all these things, so provenance would be very good. Um, in addition, there's no good mechanism to link between repositories. If, for example, an SBML model from the Biomolds database is also available as a CellML encoding from PMR2, I'd like to see a link to the uh, corresponding project. Um, yeah, and there's uh, also space for improvements in terms of quality checking and some repositories should still implement uh, these one-click simulation um, features. Yeah, and last but not least, the repositories should provide an export of container formats to support users in reproducing and publishing the studies. Yeah, and now let's come to the other side of the workflow, to the model user. How does a user get the data out of a repository? All the mentioned repositories already provide a search form, but in my experience it's rather limited and I always struggle finding what I need. The ranking also has some flaws and often you just get single files, not uh, ranked simulation studies. In Rostock, we developed a new workflow for searching and retrieving simulation studies that uses a graph-based uh, database in the back end which indexes the data of open model repositories like BioModels and PMR2. You already heard about graph-based databases from Neil and his Symbiochem DB. The idea is that you can link models in different formats and simulation descriptions and publications and ontologies and all these things uh, in a very big graph. Using this representation, it's much easier to search for simulation studies. So you just type your keyword into a web form that gets translated into a Neo4j graph query and you get back your results of a, as a ranked list of simulation studies. The tool also knows where the original data uh, can be found and goes to these different locations to collect everything that's related to a certain study. You can then export the results as a combined archive and maybe open it in some tool of your choice or you open the archive in the combined archive web interface and with a single click uh, that archive can be um, simulated at the CellML web tools where you can also rerun the experiment and modify the study for your needs. But there are still some um, issues that we need to deal with. So for example, how should we rank diff uh, different indices? Um, we can for example search for persons, for models, or publications and annotations, but how should we merge the results? Um, and moreover, there's space for improvements uh, at the connections to existing databases, so we can also include other databases and 
um, yeah, get more information. And this uh, approach doesn't doesn't re uh, respect um, versions at the moment. But a changed model usually uh, means also also changed results. Does a changed model also mean that's a different study? And how to compare different versions of a model? And that brings me to my next slide. So how can you compare different versions of a model? Let's, let's imagine you build a model in CellML and you're quite happy with it, so you want to share that with your collaborators. And some days later, you get back a modified version of your model that suddenly has a different outcome. So how can you find out what has happened to your model? Of, your, of course, you can try to compare the source code and look into the model itself, but usually models are so big that it's neither useful nor, nor efficient uh, to do that as a human. So you better let that do machines. And I actually know a very good tool that is able to compare versions of uh, computational models, and it's called Beavis. Beavis is able to identify the differences and to communicate them in a human-readable way. Here you can see screenshots of two comparisons that, I, that I've done in preparation of this talk. The left-hand side shows you the highlighted chemical reaction network that makes it very easy to understand which part of the model were subject to a change. That's, by the way, a screenshot of our prototype butthead. Of course, you cannot see all the differences in, in, in such a visual, visualizations, um, and therefore Beavis also generates uh, detailed reports. On the right-hand side, you can see a screenshot of the functional creation web lab that's running in Oxford. Um, they have implemented Beavis, and as you can see, it shows that some mass was changed between two versions of that model. Um, there were some parts of the uh, formulas removed and something else was inserted. So using Beavis, it is much easier to understand the differences between two versions of a computational model. There are, however, of course, some open issues in terms of comparing models and versions. First of all, um, the differences are not really understandable from machines yet. Beavis exports the differences in the machine-readable XML format, but that doesn't tell anything about the impact of a change. What's the effect on the model? But we've been developing an ontology called Comedy that can be used to characterize these differences. So there's already something on its way. But uh, on the other hand, Beavis is just useful when comparing versions of the same model. It would be nice to also compare different models and to compare versions of simulation descriptions and maybe even whole uh, simulation studies. I can't tell you how to compare models and simulation studies right now, but I can show you an approach to evaluate those. The guys in Oxford, um, that are Jonathan Cooper and Gary Miriams, Miriams um, they maintain a functional creation web lab. The idea is that models and simulation descriptions should be decomposed into, into multiple files. The simulation description should only loosely be connected to the uh, actual models maybe through ontology terms that tie together model entities and tasks on the experimental setup. This way you can run a single model using various, various uh, simulation setups to evaluate the model under different conditions. And simula simul similarly, you can also run models under the same condition, different models under the same condition. Here you can, for example, see the experimental ma matrix of the web lab. Every row corresponds to a model, and every column corresponds to a simulation setup. Green entity, 
green entries uh, show successful runs and red ent entries uh, failed and yeah, gray entries um, tell you that the model, model doesn't work with this simulation setup. If you, for example, have a look at the number of models under the same condition, so like for example this one, um, you will find a plot like this uh, on the bottom of this, on, on my slide. So you may be able to find a model that fits your needs. So every curve on this uh, plot corresponds to one model uh, under the certain, under the specified condition. Yeah, it's not really a comparison of models, but rather an evaluation, but it may already help you finding the model that you're looking for. Yeah, and as you already expected, um, there are some open challenges with that approach. First of all, this is only available for CellML models in a very specific domain. Yeah, and in addition, they are not really standard compliant. They develop their own proprietary format to encode for simulation descriptions and they call it protocols. And that is because the ZML standard uh, at the moment doesn't support all the features that, is, that are necessary for, for the uh, approach. Yeah, and moreover, it would be good to have some solution to throw a whole search result of a model search against the web lab to evaluate all the models, all the encoded systems against some specific conditions that you're working with or that you want to study. And yeah, therefore the interoperability is uh, still very limited. Okay, now that we went through the presented workflow pipeline, I'd like to conclude the talk with our initial modeling workflow slide. I modified it a little bit um, to also use it as an acknowledgement slide for all the people that we've been working with. In the beginning, there's uh, the create model step that I shamelessly neglected in my talk. But I'm pretty sure that you know Isa Claudine with her Jinsim team or Jackie and the JWS development team or Pedro and his Kopasi team, for example, and there are many more. Um, quite a lot of people are involved in the development of standard formats. For example, Pedro, Frank and David Nickerson, but also Vasundra and Brad. Um, but I guess most of the people on this map are involved in that somehow. Frank and David and Brad um, also think hard on, the, on how to encode experiments. And together with Frank and VG and Tommy um, and, and yeah, and Stian and uh, Martin Peters and uh, some others, uh, we are developing tools that make it easy to submit and share research results. Plenty of people are involved in the database development, for example, Natalie and Stuart from the Fadom team, Tommy and David from uh, PMR2, and Jackie and Martin from JWS, and VG from the Biomolds team. And then we have our search and retrieval uh, students, Martin Peters and Mayam Nasser, both working very hard from Rostock to help you finding the model that you're looking for. Stuart and Tommy and the Oxford guys already um, use Beavis in their tools to compare models and, and their versions. Tom and Vasunda currently develop some SPGN support for the visualization of differences. And together with Pedro, we developed the comedy ontology. And yeah, the Oxford team, um, Jonathan and Gary, uh, brought you the functional creation project. Yes, and down there in the corner, uh, we have um, the ladies who try to organize all the army of, uh, of ants. And I think they have their fingers in almost every project to tr and try to nudge us in the right direction. And yeah, you see uh, that's a highly connected graph and plenty of people are working hard to help you manage your projects. And that's uh, 
actually just my orbit. There are many more out there. Yeah, and that's it for now. A special thanks to the SAMS task force and the SBI team in Rostock. It's really cool atmosphere over here. If you ever have, uh, have the chance, come around and visit us. Um, I will leave you with the references and yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks very much, Martin. That was a really nice overview of uh, the aspects of modeling that we need to take into consideration and also a lot of the open challenges, which I noted uh, there were certainly more open challenges than there are solutions at the moment. Um, so <laughs> that's that's Maybe a good place to be, I think. That's, that's the point of research, right? Yeah. Yeah, so a lot to do for us. Yeah, exactly. We have plenty of time to have jobs still, which is great news. Uh, so um, we're open for questions. So if you want to send a question either um, by the interface control panel in questions or chat, I can pick it up and pass it on to Martin. Or you can raise your hand if you want to ask uh, in person over the microphone. Um, in the meantime, I have a couple of questions I want to ask, if that's okay. Um, sure. So one of the first questions I've got is, um, you know your slide on searching and retrieving studies, uh, the model, um, um, I guess, the, the model retrieval service? Yeah, yeah this one. Um, I was actually wondering how this ranks models to start with uh, as the first part of the question. So, yeah, so the database uh, contains multiple resources that are related to every model, to, to a certain model, like um, a model is annotated with certain terms from ontologies and it's related to a publication and, um, yeah, to certain persons that created the model or the publication. And, um, yeah, our search, um, interface, so also we index every piece of information into different indices, like there's a person index, but there's also an annotation index. Mm -hmm. And the um, search mechanism uh, searches in every index and uh, yeah, returns the results. Is that what you were uh, asking? Um, yeah, so it's so is it just trying to find whether that term exists in any of the indexes? Yeah, something yeah. like that, yeah. Okay. Um, so when when you're getting the results or the ranking, is there any, I mean, is there any particular more, um, I suppose, sophisticated way you would like to be able to search results? Um, so we have uh, a student, that's Maya Nasa. Uh, mm -hmm. working with that. Um, she's uh, currently um, evaluating different ranking algorithms or okay. um, ranking aggreg aggregation methods to merge these lists into to a, um, yeah, merged search results that we can use all these things. Okay, so into, I suppose, more of a relevance to original search query or something like that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. Um, and also, I've got another question that's uh, related to... So you mentioned about being able to compare different versions of models with uh, Beavis. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to compare different models, um, what do you think we would need... What do you think we would need to know before we could compare, like, outputs of models, for instance? Um, um, <clears throat> so what Beavis currently does to uh, map entities of models in, onto each other is he makes use of uh, ontology terms and um, um, identifiers in the underlying uh, XML files. Um, but of course if you uh, um, have two different models. They will for sure have different uh, identifiers in the XML document and probably uh, um, use different ontologies even if they model the same thing. And it's very hard to compare. So um, one solution would be to have a proper distance measurements between uh, terms from diff different ontologies. Um, this 
distance needs to be um, uh, calculable uh, very fast um, or you need uh, some um, mechanisms to uh, yeah compare the graphs the network structure of the uh, computations models for example to um, yeah find common substructures and um, that and propagate the uh, these mappings into the rest of the model for example um, okay so we've still got quite a lot of work to do before we can yeah, get near there indeed yeah okay um, we're a bit slow on the questions front from uh, the audience and I suspect that might be because everybody's already in summer mode. So I'm going to ask one more question. <laughs> um, so you mentioned the web lab and that it's yeah. very specific for cardiac models at the moment and uses also, um, I, I think you mentioned bespoke algorithms to analyze the models. Um, do you think this would be useful um, for comparing SBML models, so like constraint-based and kinetic models, um, in a similar way? Yeah, sure. So um, it would be good to um, run like a bunch of uh, SBML models against the same simulation description, for example, mm -hmm. to see how they perform under these conditions. Yeah. Um, and do you think do you think we have some of the um, Given we have um, software like Kaparzi and stuff, do you think the scope for having more standardized version of algorithms is, uh, I suppose, more more available for that type of modeling as well? Yeah, I think that it's not far away. Uh, well, I, I don't know, actually. Um, I think there's a lot to do on the uh, simulation description side. Mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah. Yeah, and how to, to tie these things together. Yeah, um, but you think it's something that would be useful for the community to... Yeah, for uh, sure. Okay, that sounds quite interesting. All right, so there's uh, there's no more questions uh, this side, um, so I'm excellent. going to thank you for uh, an excellent presentation. Thanks for finishing us off on a high, and uh, it was very nice to, it's very nice to have you on our webinar today. So thank you very yeah, much once you. again, and... Um, I'm sure we'll see you in Manchester in the future again soon, or we'll be in Rostock. For sure, yeah. Okay. I'm looking forward. Yeah, me too. All right, thanks very much. Um, bye. bye. Um, and now um, we're just going to um, wrap up. Uh, obviously, we'll be coming back hopefully late autumn to bring you a new webinar series. Uh, if you remain signed up to this webinar series, uh, we'll keep you posted of when the new series is starting so you can sign up to that and uh, you can get more information obviously about better data and model management practices. So thanks for joining us for the whole season and we hope we'll be able to keep up with you next season as well.